right, Jordan. Hey, man. Uh, welcome back. <laughs> it's good to be back, John. So we're still uh, in November uh, 2022, and we are uh, heading down to uh, Sehertenbosch uh, to meet up with uh, Mark Wackenberg, uh, Bicycle Dutch. And uh, yeah, we're going to go for a little uh, bike ride, or I should say a big bike ride. It was an a epic one, bike yeah. ride. I know. This was a memorable <laughs> one. I was looking forward to it, and I think it lived up to the hype. For sure, for sure. So uh, we're just going to roll this uh, and uh, pretty much uh, there's not a whole lot of sound to it. At the very beginning, Mark gives a, gives a quick little introduction and then we just sort of uh, roll along. There will be a couple of sections uh, where we pause and let uh, Mark, uh, you know, really kind of describe oh, cool. a couple of different infrastructure things and some uh, cultural things. Uh, but then uh, then we'll go ahead and, and reflect upon uh, some of those things because you and I haven't had a chance to really debrief on what we saw that day. So let's let's roll it here with uh, with yeah. Mr. Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Wagenbier and I'm also known as Bicycle Dutch. And here we are in Sertum Bosch, in sort of this main a, area. a map of what our plan, but I don't know if we cycle everything, but okay. there's also links. I wrote a book, blog post about this. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, so he has a, a blog post about this sort of ride uh, around his hometown here. And yeah. uh, so we're, we're just sort of rolling out and he immediately starts kind of... <laughs> Thank you. Even criticizing this little segment going, man, it should have been done better. But yeah. uh, what, what, were, what were your thoughts when we were just started rolling? Because, uh, you know, we met up with him, had a, a like a coffee some in the downtown Old Town area, and then we just started rolling. Yeah, yeah he didn't love the mixing of uh, uses in that space, which I was a little surprised by, but his rationale made sense. Yeah, um, yeah. But obviously this is like pretty great off the bat it didn't hurt that we were there in fall yeah uh, <laughs> for sure turning and falling and you and you decided to pace us you decided to run off the front here <laughs> yeah i decided enough of sticking in the back i'm yeah yeah uh I'm you, you did look way. back and uh, to confirm that we were moving forward and going straight through this intersection but this particular yeah. intersection is also is the critical green, yeah i think we were also talking about there how the green light it seemed like that was one of those that the green light sort of um, detected us. And it um, did. Yeah. So he down. was he was back talking with me about explaining the app, the app that he was, you know, that right. he turned on so that his app on his phone was communicating ahead of time with the the signals. And yeah. then we actually leave um, the the municipality of Sertombosch and, and kind of move on. And then it doesn't work in the next village over. But we actually pause here and talk a little bit about this because it used to be a, uh, a roundabout where the cycle tracks were at the same level as the, the roundabout. And it just didn't work very well because it's a turbo roundabout. And uh, so what they did was they lowered it down and kept us at the at the higher level. And we were able to continue over via these two separate uh, elevated bridges. But really, they're not elevated. They actually depressed this uh, roundabout. Really fascinating. I was blown away yeah. by this. This was ingenious. Um, yeah. And like it, it uh, it's like two totally different experiences on, you know, on bike or in a car, but it worked, it worked fine for us. Like it didn't even feel, I mean, it was a novelty, but it didn't feel like we were being put out by the way it was designed. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a great example of how the Dutch do the parking protected uh, bikeways. And uh, you'll, there was a, a gentleman sort of flung his door open and yet there was still plenty of room for him to be able yeah. to, you know, open his door and we were able to, to get around and it was no problem. And here we are actually talking about the fact that the app didn't work. We had to actually yeah. stay there for the sensors, the loop yeah. detectors to get us. Yeah, you mentioned the flinging the door open. Uh, it's one thing to deal with a flung door open on the passenger side. It's a whole different one if you're driver side on, you know, driver side door on one side and traffic on the other side of you. I hate those bike lanes that, you know, straddle between traffic and and parked cars. I don't know about you, John. Yeah, yeah, no. Not I, that we I, see I, them in 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 the Netherlands, pretty much almost anywhere, but. Yeah, there, there's a there's a few. They're out common there, in Dallas, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> and here we're, we end up talking a little bit about the, the design of this particular uh, bollard that's in the center there. And he was pointing out that it was done, the white markings were done properly so that, uh, you know, people who are riding can easily see that the, the bollard is there. And again, proof that even in the Netherlands, they will put a bollard in on uh, a feats pod to make sure that no motor vehicle drivers get confused and drive down them. So sometimes yeah, the they get us grief about that. Right. The <laughs> visibility thing, like, it's just, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like, you just don't want to run into a bollard no matter who you are. Yeah. Um, and that could be pretty nasty. It, I could certainly think of, we, we had a recent installment of bike lanes on a, on a three, you know, a six lane down to a four lane here in Dallas. And uh, they could use some bollards in the middle of those, uh, in the middle of those bike lanes because there's been cars lining up in there, you know, trying to turn into the, into the car wash. So, you know, maybe we could take a, a note from the Netherlands that even, even there, sometimes those bollards still are necessary. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. So uh, what's really cool about uh, this segment here is, you know, we, we kind of got out of that other village. Now we're in this really cool sort of rural area, but we see, have a visual, a long distance visual of the, the, the steeple of the church and the, the city is off to the left. And, uh, it's just so cool that we, you know, you have this, you know, network of pathways that go through these uh, more natural areas and rural areas. And this is like literally the middle of the day and you just see how many people are out getting in some fresh air and some exercise. Yeah. It's just so, so incredibly refreshing. Yeah. I don't have anything to add to that. Totally agree. So what, what a, we're what a come- resource. I know. Well, it is just such a tremendous resource. And we also talked a little bit about um, the fact that the coloring of these feats pods um, are are a neutral color, just the, the gray, the normal asphalt here. Um, and, and it's because there's no motor vehicles allowed in this area. So there's no um, message that needs to be sent to motor vehicle drivers that, oh, by the way, the, you know, it's bicycle priority. So they can actually go with the cheaper asphalt that doesn't need the red pigment to it. And, uh, and we also talked a little bit about the fact that it's shared space with pedestrians and it's totally fine that they are there. And of course we, as, um, on a bike would just need to yield to the more vulnerable users. Right. Did we discuss what these little hash marks are? Uh, we didn't really, not not definitively. You mean like in the middle of the yeah. uh, of the path there, or off At to the, the edge, side? Yeah. Oh, the yeah, edge is. Yeah. I think that those are um, to to help with visibility. And then this, of course, is uh, the uh, public uh, beach. Makes sense. Yeah. So he's just only yeah about. only bike parking. Yeah. yeah only bike parking here at this beach. And he's talking a little bit about how they sort of dredged that out and created this. It's a very this. special type of semi-protected cycle cycling infrastructure because there's a big blob here. That's because there's a school here and these school children would do anything. So they just legalized it and, and made that safe okay. to go diagonally here instead of straight on into two turns like Two stages, I mean. Right. So that's also a Dutch trait. Right. We don't um, forbid things. Right. We try to make what people will do anything anyway safe. Right. So we do a lot of experiments in this country to see, okay, people do this. How can we make that safe enough? Right. So Mark, let's talk about this uh, roadway design here. Yeah, I wanted to show this yeah. because this is actually not what we like best mm-hmm. in this country. Right. But as you can see, we have everything. Right. At least it's wide enough. There's no parking, only few end destinations. So that's when you can do it. Right. On street cycle lanes. Yeah. But we are not fond of them. Yeah. This and may also be like a heritage. This is designed probably in the 60s and 70s. Right. This whole neighborhood. And at those de- in those days, they didn't really do many separate cycleways yet right everywhere ah you also like this all right so we'll we'll pause just a second before we talk about this because this is an actual uh feet strotter bicycle priority street and uh, uh but i want to give you a chance to reflect on 
what we just what you just heard there <laughs> because that was pretty yeah. phenomenal that sort of approach culturally to uh the work that they've been doing yeah i think that back when we were at that intersection near where the school is and he was talking about how they just observed what the kids are going to do anyway and instead of making the users be wrong all the time they decided to work with that and like that was like sort of the one of the biggest points that is worth taking away from uh, not only this ride, but just from like the Dutch approach to um, cycling design as a whole, who is like working with human behavior uh, and maybe <laughs> having the humility to be like, well, if we come up with a design and people use it how we don't want them to, then like who's wrong, right? Um, and what and what outcomes do we want? I I love that so much. And maybe that's why in part it's a little bit, not always like you can't just cut and paste a typical Dutch design, you know, and put it into any other context. It's the you you take the approach, which is to understand human behavior and psychology and a bunch of other things and then apply it on a case by case basis. I, I really love yeah. that point. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're about to hear him talk a little bit about how uh, the Feetstraat, the, the bicycle priority streets that we see all around the Netherlands and we you know, have come to love so much, really aren't even an official <laughs> legal construct. And so he talks a little bit about that after we uh, we mentioned the, these beautiful, the beautiful yeah, stonework another here. Another charming cultural feature. Yeah. The integrated yeah. Uh, stonework. I love the stonework. And this is a cycle street. And funny enough, since the cycling street sign is not yet law, right. this city doesn't use it. Oh, There's okay. no cycle street sign in this country, in this uh, municipality in this at municipality. all. But you, the design speaks for it. But you can see it has all the characteristics of right. the cycle street and the raised median in the middle. Mm -hmm. So cars really have to go over it to, to overtake uh, cyclists. Right. It is like a like a custom that you don't overtake a cyclist in a cycle street, but it is not law yet. I love that that right there too. Um, we'll, we'll press play again because I think he, he may say a few more words, but it's like, it's not a law, it's just a custom. So cool. I wish it was a custom to, I wish it was a custom here <laughs> on, on the shared, uh, you know, the residential streets where you can share the street. I wish it was more of a custom here. Yeah, 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 I hear you. So yeah, now we're rolling down uh, this particular uh, feet strut and um, we, we have this opportunity to, to see a couple of, um, yeah, there's a, that, that's right. He's pointing out that that was one of the few stop signs that we'll, you know, we kind of see uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, I think it was probably the first stop sign that we had seen uh -huh. on this trip. Can you recall seeing also, another one? Also, um, there was one in Delft that I saw. Okay. Um, Got it. yeah, but it, it's obviously it stood out. I mean, that like sort of clover leaf situation back there, Yeah, you know, might be a place where they just, you know, no one would even attempt having, um, bike infrastructure crossing through, yeah. but it, there it was done probably, I mean, it works there. And also the drivers are maybe more trained to look out for people crossing. I could see that being pretty, pretty harrowing and so on some of ours over here. Yeah, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right, and I think he had mentioned too that that was sort of a, a trade off for that location. It's a, a legacy; yeah. they wouldn't have built it that way um, to begin right. with. We're about ready to just roll through um, this this particular uh, roundabout. It's uh, not the ideal design uh, of for a roundabout, but uh, we just kind of roll through it sense and he he kind of points out that yeah this is not the the current standards of of how they do roundabouts which we will see in just a few minutes um and we'll we'll pause and let him uh, talk a little bit about uh, that design but uh yeah it was just it was kind of extraordinary you know literally all the amazing things and this is still the just the very first part of our ride before we yeah. paused for lunch <laughs> That was pretty cool. And, and he had commented uh, on that sports cyclist that went past and, and basically said, commented on how polite he was because he, he let us know that he was coming up from behind and, and yeah. uh, 
for or for for context, this is actually a uh, a Saturday. So this is a Saturday morning. We're out doing this ride. This was a this was an odd one. So the, this, or it yeah. felt it felt odd. Yeah, the two yeah. way um, roundabout for yep. for bikes. Yeah. And so take note, I mean, this is this massive two-way roundabout and he's, he's just beaming because he's super excited to show us this particular location. Uh, awesome. And uh, can you, can you uh, recall what, what this was all about? Oh yeah. Yeah. This was awesome. This was basically like a, a strode once upon a time. And there was also another route that kind of runs parallel to it pretty close, what, 500 meters away or something like that. And they were just basically like, eh, we don't really need this anymore. Um, but it was kind of expensive to rip up the pavement. So they left a lot of it and they're going to, they kind of did this while they decide what, what to do more permanently. Yeah. Yeah. And then off to the left, there is this big, huge pile of leaves from the leaf yeah. sweepers. And, uh, and so that's kind of a mulch pile there, but yeah, super cool to see that, you know, the, the two way roundabout structure there. We'll talk a little bit more about the pros and cons of that. Um, but right now we're actually rolling past a sports f- facility. So that's a swimming facility on the left and then the soccer or football stadium on the right. And, and he made the point that, yeah, everybody rides their bikes there. Bunch of hippies. Then, yeah, a bunch of hippies. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he's also super excited to show us this. So this is the F-59, yeah, uh, you know, sort of cross high speed route. I shouldn't say high speed. It's, it's really meant to be a, uh, a, a route that, you know, kind of gets the, the riders away from traffic and it can be a, a straight through route. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. And you yeah, can actually see those, mar- you can see those markings on the, on the side there. And yeah, he did, yep. he did let me know that that was due for, uh, for visibility, especially on really densely foggy days and rainy days. Ah. And then one of the main canal routes here, as he said, the this is the new canal. And down below, you'll see uh, that there are pathways on both sides of this main canal. Uh, on the left was actually a recreational route, and then on the right was, uh, you know, sort of the main cycle route. As we come around here, if you look up, you'll see uh, that there is a person with a kind of a push mobility device there. So he was with his walker. And so he's out getting a a nice stroll in and it just really kind of exemplifies that uh, it's a mobility facility. It's really, truly in all ages and abilities, you know, type of facility. Yeah. And we're actually um, getting into a, a village area that had been sort of annexed into the city. So this is actually uh, was previously a, its own municipality, uh, but then got annexed into the city. Um, and we're going to head in and have lunch. And again, you get to see some the beautiful uh, trees here. You get to see the Rays intersections. And here we are. Mm-hmm. So how cool was this? Yeah, this was an ideal spot. I I know you got a lot of good footage of people using this space and kind of a a mixing place for for multiple users, but all pretty, pretty manageable speeds. Yeah, this is beautiful. Yeah, so we're just we're just kind of hanging out there, having a, a a nice little lunch, and I was just shooting some footage while we were eating, and uh, uh, just really kind of soaking up the fact that you know when it's a car free space like that, people just really come out and really enjoy the day. Yeah. And uh, again, we're sort of you know making our way through this this little village area here. He really pointed out too that this is uh, similar to what I saw in Houghton, which is you 
you have these, you know, pathways where people are able to, you know, be able to get around mobility wise. And yep. many of these car or many of these houses do have cars that you can see there, but they have a separate route to be able to get to their houses. Yeah. Yeah. It's a simple concept, but just making some routes only available to biking or walking. Yeah. I mean, you could see how that makes the place quieter. Yeah. And, you know, a mobility device like we just saw there. So, I mean, really, if you think of it, I mean, that was, that was a suburban context. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Look at this bridge. And this is all a, a, you know, a bike pedestrian, you know, bridge to get you over some major barriers, both the major highway there. And then again, that new canal there. And we, we did get a little glimpse of that. And then again, this major highway, he's pointing to that sound barrier. Uh, yep. it, because as soon as we passed that, that point, the, 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 the volumes went way down. It was much more pleasant to ride. Yeah. They're pretty intentional about the sound from cars, um, whether using the, the special pavement treatments, um, those sound barriers, but I know that's like a feature of Dutch law, right? Is that there's limits to the noise you can be subject to, yeah. um, in different types of buildings. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, here, and here's that sound barrier again. I, I reversed just about 30 seconds because I wanted to point out something that he was pointing to. And that is, you can see it flashing there in the distance. He was actually saying that he was astounded by the number of people who are speeding on that section and basically was saying, yeah, they're all speeding, that they really need to change the design of that road because it's just encouraging yeah. people to drive too fast. Yeah, that's, we didn't see many of those, right? Those, um, here's what your speed is. I might've been the only one I can recall seeing. Yeah, yeah. And we can tell that it, it was a pretty major route. I mean, it, it is a four lane and, you know, we just don't see a lot of those. This is pausing real quick because this is uh -huh. pointing out that the more powerful motor scooters, that was their off point. They were supposed to get off uh, at that point. And so here is the properly designed roundabout situation where Beautiful. bikes and peds have priority. Yeah, that was, that was great. This was like, this was a dream to use. Yeah, to nice me, greenery. It's just, yeah, it's, it, for, it's very zen-like. <laughs> Much better than a signalized intersection, isn't yes. it? <laughs> so Much, Much better, faster. yeah. Yeah. Much better than a signalized intersection. Yeah, and much faster for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Very comfortable. Yet another roundabout. Again, almost by the book, but two directions, half of it. So that's a bit strange. Yeah, but they're, it's much more comfortable and they're much safer roundabouts. And if you design them properly, they're safer for everybody. Right. And we're going to, this one was a strange one because as he was pointing out, it was bi-directional one side, so. We're back on the F-59 again. Uh, we should stop here. This was the Netherlands' first roundabout with bi-directional cycling. Okay. So the city here ch tried whether you could cycle in two directions on a roundabout and whether it'd still be safe. Right. The verdict is not really out on it because the city now said we should uh, may, we shouldn't make any new ones because some scholars say that this is unsafe mm -hmm. but um, investigations do show that there are fewer accidents on two-way cycle paths around roundabouts than there are on one-way cycle paths so hmm. there's something strange going on here right we do know that roundabouts are better, safer than signalized intersections. Right. And there, you can see that traffic has never really stopped. So only sometimes they have to stop a little bit, but it is all going slowly and smoothly. And yeah, really interesting to stand here and to watch it. And when you really think of it, Jordan, it's it, oftentimes the excuse is given, well, we just don't have space to be able to do a proper roundabout. The reality is, is that 
many of these locations were conversions from massive intersections right. that were strodes. Uh, this makes it look wider than it is because this is on super uh, a wide angle lens. But I mean, this is just so amazing how comfortable it is. And, and people are just getting going about their day. Yeah. And I could, I was thinking about why they might want to use the two way for this. And maybe Mark said this, maybe I just invented this, but I think you could see on a bigger one like this, cause this is bigger than a lot of the roundabouts we use, like it being tempting to go the wrong way as a cyclist and cut the corner off. And this just makes that actually like allowable. You know, if you're making a left turn and like don't want to go all the way around, I could see that being kind of tempting to, you know, maybe, maybe that's where the more wrecks come from. I don't, I don't really know, yeah, but yeah, yeah, this is great. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's uh, you know, a couple of tweens right there, uh, rolling by and, uh, saying hi to the camera <laughs> as well. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, and, and you got moms with, you know, kids on the bike. And in a second, we're going to see a person go by on a mobility scooter. So, I mean, all ages and abilities, you know, facilities, it's still processing and moving a large number of motor vehicles through this space, but it's done in a safe and comfortable manner. So, yeah. And on that, on that, um, roundabout thing, maybe if we hop back a second. Yeah. Um, this is the latest. I just, one of the features that I just love so much and, and they do this on driveway, you know, intersection treatments is how there's always space for, uh, lingering the car to pull off out of the out of the roundabout or heading out mm -hmm. of the roundabout, but there's still space for them to hang there for a second. Car cars still move through the roundabout, and then you know you you let the yeah. cyclist go, and you can continue. Like that's like a I feel yeah, like right. an underrated feature of these. Right here is what what you're talking about. So this gentleman yeah. is, is is proceeding through here. And, you know, you've got the, the car who is, uh, you know, yielding and yet, you know, the, the through traffic can still, you know, proceed as, as needed. The white car. Oh no, the white car yeah. is going around. So yeah. No, that's yeah. I mean, was. you see it on the, yeah. on the person entering the, the roundabout too. It's like yeah. space to kind of wait, but not block the, not block either car traffic or, yeah. um, bike flow. Yeah. 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 On this particular uh, piece of infrastructure, uh, we do see the red color here. Uh, this is a bike priority uh, section. This is bi-directional for people on bikes, but one way for, for people uh, driving. And you know, Mark is talking a little bit about just, again, a custom. It's customary for us not to ride side by side uh, since it's so narrow when the motor vehicle. So he, we actually went single file uh, just to be you know courteous to the drivers, which you know, hey, that's a nice thing. Let's be courteous to everybody. Yeah. And it just works just super fine. And we're all very I chill. I think there's a temptation to say uh, it's as a response to, oh, the Dutch are just different. Like, well, yeah. nothing's cultural. It's all design. But at a certain point, like there are, like Mark has pointed out various points where some things are just a cultural norm at a certain point. Right. Because people are cyclists in addition to being drivers. And it, I think it's it, it, it's helpful, and I'll, I'll bring us back to this point here. It's helpful to, to make the point that the infrastructure helps to reinforce the more social behavior and, and, and being able to, yeah. uh, you know, kind of get along in that sense. We're not, you know, just that I, I think I've said it before where oftentimes with signalized intersections and lanes where you feel like you have your space, I have my space, there starts to get that sense of entitlement. And yep. it, it's like, I have priority, you don't have priority. And it takes away some of that negotiation that needs to take place. And that's why, yeah. one of the reasons why shared space is so, um, phenomenal and magical in many areas is that, you know, it gives, it, it kind of brings that temperature down and you, you just all, you know, kind of need to get along. It's like on a crowded sidewalk in New York city, you don't 
I mean, yeah, you may be a little brusque, but you, you, you wouldn't necessarily behave super badly. If you did, you'd probably get shouted down. So, <laughs> right. you know, there's, right. A, there's a little bit of uh, self-management of the system, not the law or the legality system. Yeah. And that's the great point, right? The infrastructure can hopefully ultimately lead to different expectations yeah. uh, of behavior. Like if you plopped this street into somewhere in Dallas, for example, you may or may not have people like driving super careful. Like I think you might have a lot of drivers carry the assumption that like wherever I can go, that's where I'm the person in charge. And so you need to kind of get out of my way um, yeah. because you're carrying the assumptions baked into the rest of the system. But here right. it's, yeah, I don't know. That's, I think well, we've part of the, I, I guess point. part of the assumption to give that as, as an example is that because the red asphalt is here, it's sending a clear message to the drivers that, oh, by yeah. the way, this is a bicycle priority street. You know, you've been alerted. Now, if this was a black asphalt area and, and wasn't deemed as, as priority for people on bikes, who knows, maybe they're a little bit more entitled. I don't know. That's, yeah. Yeah. Well, and also it's, you know, I think it matters that like we have a lot of indications to drivers of what the behavior is supposed to be like where you're supposed to like crosswalks. I mean, how many crosswalks can you think of on this continent where theoretically they're an indication of who's who's got the right to to be there? Right. But like they aren't really respected because I think Mark made the comment at some point on one of these rides that below 30 kilometers per hour people are much more likely to slow their movement and above that, regardless yeah. of who they are, they're just less likely to, to slow down and give that, that, um, you know, give the nod to the, to the person crossing. Like if, yeah. if we have these cues of what the driver is supposed to do, it can't just be, it's gotta be like physical in addition to the visual markings. Yeah. yeah. And I do believe that that was part of the discussion when we were at that, that massive roundabout, uh, so we, we, yeah, did, yeah. we did, we did kind of silence that so that uh, we could reflect on that. Uh, so we're, we're going to get up to this next uh, major intersection here in just a moment. And this is fun because this is where uh, we're sort of geeking out on traffic uh, signals. And there, there's a lot of little nuances in, in this segment. And we'll, we'll take it all the way through uh, the markings of the poles uh, before we, we pause and, and chat again. But I, I think it's, it, it was pretty cool to just kind of hang out there and, and observe the this situation. This is the latest. All these trees with a circle around it were replanted here when this was redesigned. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the traffic light installation is solar powered. Ah. And it actually generates so much power that it is more than needed. So the rest goes back to the grid. And we have the very special near side signs, uh, traffic lights for, um, so we have near side traffic lights for pedestrians. Right. Normally, all traffic lights in the Netherlands are near side, so you don't get people crawling onto the intersection. Mm -hmm. But for pedestrians, that was different. Pedestrians always had the signal on the other side of the street. Here, they made them next to them where you cross. Mm -hmm. So people have to look besides them why is that? Because we only have four second green cycles here. Uh, and sometimes pedestrians would panic mm. if they were only halfway right. and the light would already be red. Right. But there is no problem there because the signal is a starting signal. Right. But if you see a, as a red signal in the distance, you, I, I understand that you get confused. Yeah. So that is why they put them now on the near side. You will have walked on and it will be red behind you, but mm -hmm. you won't notice. So right, you can right. just uh, relax. Uh, finish your uh, crossing and that's it right so that's a, also again a novelty in this town right so they try things here you, you can't really see it but they have countdowns on the on the yellow light for cars mm -hmm. three two one and then you can go sometimes when they're stood like right. this yeah Oh, that's very British. Yeah. <laughs> stood like this. <laughs> you know, when the cars are, are, are stopped like that and they get a green light, the, it usually will count down from three, two, one. Again, that's not in the Dutch uh, regulations yet, mm -hmm. so it's kind of illegal. Right. But the Minister of Transport said that's an interesting thing to do, so let's see what that 
rings. Right. And um, the traffic light expert here explained to me that it clears the intersection seconds sooner. Right. And every second counts in an installation like this. Right. So he was happy with it. Yeah. But they don't do it when there are no cars standing because otherwise you would see it from the distance. Oh, I'm going to speed and make it. Yeah. So they only do it when cars are standing still. Yeah. Yeah. And actually this is a main cycle route to the north and this mm. was the main cycle route to us to the east. So yeah. Can I push the button? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can. <laughs> And you don't even have to push the button because it's not, there it's are loops underneath it. Yeah, yeah. Here, this is the modern version where you can't even see the loops because they're under the asphalt. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. See, this oh. is the near side signal for pedestrians. Yeah. And it will get red before he gets yep. the other. See, it's already red and he's it's not even red. halfway yet. No need to panic. Right. That's all accounted for. Just do not start again anymore. Yeah. There's a different phasing for every direction, whether right. you go right from that side, left from that side. Yeah. Here you can see that people going right and going left are going at the same time yeah. from different roads. Yeah. And then they go yeah. while they are still going. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. It's too complicated to explain almost. No, and, no, yeah, it's, that's And good. you can also not film it and then think, oh, that's the cycle. No, every cycle is different yeah, depending yeah. on the traffic. Yeah. I feel like the black and white of the posts is really helpful. Like, yeah, because really you can see them in the you can see them in the dark the and you can see them in bright sunlight. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you repeat uh, that? So uh, the traffic lights, the poles, they have a mm -hmm. uh, a white and, and, and black bands. Mm -hmm. So you can see them in dark. Uh, surrounding so mm -hmm. if it's dark you can see them because the white stands out and if it's bright sunlight the black stands out so right yeah so yeah. you see them always you see them always yeah because you have to stay away from the poles good good catch there Jordan yeah and what is also nice you don't have to go to the pole of the light to mm -hmm. push the button right the button yeah. is always on a separate pole ahead otherwise you would be with your front wheel you would already be on the road Ah, the details. <laughs> There's a lot to chew on there, uh, Jordan. Uh, thoughts, man. Oh, the last thing he said is just one of my like pet peeves um, mm -hmm. over here is when the the well, even having a button in in the first place, but then it's also like a pain to get to, um, or yeah. potentially impossible, depending on like what type of user you are. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and and there uh, that was just chock full of stuff. And that particular edit, we went through it a lot quicker than the original video. Uh, but and and he talked a little bit more about the the tree and the greening of that particular environment because yeah. they actually did pay a uh, depave a lot there. And then they brought uh -huh. these trees in, and they're trying to to add more green elements uh, for more. Uh, flood water, uh, you know, and storm water, you know, uh, filtration and things of that nature. But he also made the comment, it's still a massively wide road for the Netherlands. And so yeah. it's, it's still too big. One of the small points that he made that I thought was really interesting and insightful was how there's the countdown clock for uh, drivers, mm -hmm. but only if they're stopped. Right. And not if they're approaching from further because it could induce them to pick up their speed through right. the intersection. And I think it's this like it makes it clear that the idea is like quick, efficient movement, th like efficient movement through the intersection and clearing it like at it, clearing it sooner than you would, but right. not high speed through there. And like it might seem like they're the same thing at first, but they're. That goes to the whole Dutch principle of like, you either have the purpose being movement or the purpose being exchange, like safe exchange. And the safe exchange is not helped by having anyone speed up. It's just like one of those little things where they understand this is going to mean one thing to a stopped driver and another thing to a moving, you know, vehicle. Yeah. And I loved what he was saying about the, the pedestrian uh, signals and bringing that closer to yeah. where the pedestrian is. They get their green. That green is assembled uh, or is a signal to be able to start moving 
it turns red after they've already passed, but they're not staring at anything that's flashing red at them that causes them to feel like they need to hurry and, and to panic. And so, it, again, just incredibly uh, thoughtful towards the more vulnerable users. And you see the same thing with the uh, the signals, with the, the bike signals. It's the same thing. It's a near side. It's right there by you. You get the green, you proceed forward, and you're not freaking out that you're somehow not going fast enough. Yeah, that's like, that's a step beyond the physical nature of the intersection into saying like, what will make a person's stress level rise just because of a blinking light, even though there is the exact same amount of time to cross and everything like that's like a whole next level of understanding of like what makes things comfortable or not. Yeah. Ninja human dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, we, uh, we make our way past this, uh, surprisingly busy little street here and, uh, and then head in on this, this quiet side street. And, you know, we, we comment a little bit along the way about, you know, some of the, the features here. Again, this is a bricked uh, area. And he makes the comment that the, the message to the drivers in these bricked zones is that um, this is not a through street. This is going to be something where you are there for a reason. And then here yeah. uh, he's pointing out that this big building on the right is uh, used to be a school, uh, like a university or, or something like that, a secondary school. And now it's housing. So they decided that it was a better purpose. And this is a street just for cycling and buses. And there are cameras detecting illegal car use here. And they ah. just get the ticket in the mail. OK. And it's so much nicer now. Ticket in it's the mail. It's just 100 mail, yeah. 100 meters. Yeah. But it makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah, there's the speed camera. Yeah, it's not the speed camera here. It's just de yeah. detecting illegal use of the street. And because of this license plate, people just get the, the yeah. ticket in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> 100 euros. The dystopian big brother watching. <laughs> 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 it's like, don't break the, don't break the law. You know, it's like simple yeah. as that. You know, I don't know why it has to be so hard, uh, but we're, we're getting into the historic core now and, and just getting into some of these areas. There's a pedestrian uh, street area there where you can ride your bike, but you, again, you have to yield to uh, the more vulnerable users. And then we're rolling past some really cool High motor vehicle cars. permeability, uh, traffic calming. And again, you can just tell how dead this is. Here we area have a is. sort of a shared space, like yeah, it's, a shame. it's a home zone, Von Erf. Ah, Von Erf. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Von Erf. I need to keep yeah. working on my pronunciation of, of I keep calling it Woon Erf, and, and our, our Dutch friends are saying, no, Von Erf. Yeah. Sorry. Get Thanks, together, guys. John. Appreciate it. <laughs> But yeah, so we're, we're really coming to the end of our bike ride here. Uh, just take a moment to reflect on the on the bike ride before we start to strolling around the city. Well, lots of things to say, lots of things stand out. But the biggest thing is how many different applications we saw of what, you know, you could call bike infrastructure or just, you know, navigating how there's space constraints and... Um, Every intersection we saw was a little bit different. Um, the the type of on street or separated from the street bike infrastructure was different. And you know, there you can see the way that they're always improving and and changing things, and that's really inspiring. Yeah. And uh, again, this is Saturday afternoon, and uh, this is the market in, in front of one of the uh, historic plazas or square areas. And we got to a nice elevated position so I could snap this particular shot. And um, so we're walking around at this point and, um, and sort of bringing our, our day to a close. Uh, and, and this will help us bring our video reaction video here to a close. Uh, but as this is just kind of rolling through, uh, any, any final thoughts on uh, the, the visit to Sertombosch? Yeah, I think I would just say, you know, a little bit outside the off the beaten path for many visitors to the Netherlands who might come to um, North Holland. Uh, definitely make the trip to Den Bosch or Sertogenbosch. 
I think. Um, Mark was a great Mark was a great host, which was not surprising to me. But Dan Bosch was in, was amazing, really yeah, amazing. It really was. And the, this is the famous dessert that we were uh, told we we must try when we had dinner with uh, Chris and Melissa. And Melissa says, "Oh no, you you have to make sure that you have this." And I'm terrible with names of food, but I think you know what this is. Was it Boschen? Uh, uh, Bolenbosch? I think is that that's right? it. Bolenbosch? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that, like that Mark that. actually has it outlined on the map, um, but, uh, in, in the location that we went to, but it was. Boschen uh, Bolen the- or Bo- Bolen Boschen. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> well, it was certainly delicious and, uh, and a real treat. And, and, and speaking of a treat, you know, Mark, thank you so very much for, uh, for doing this. This is the map of the journey that he was so wonderful to put together. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what a great trip. And, uh, Jordan, thank you so much for, uh, doing this reaction video and going back down memory lane once again, again, this was November 5th. And, uh, so we're getting close to your departure date, uh, which was the ninth. So we only have a couple more days uh, left. And I think, I want to say that November 6th, we got rained out. It was Sunday and uh, we did do a little bit of uh, fun video. So we may have a reaction video just to that little um, a rainy day uh, video that I shot. Uh, and we'll keep it short because we didn't we didn't do a whole lot on Sunday. It was sort of a rest day for us. But uh, again, thank you so much for going back down memory lane and and uh, taking a look at Sehertenbosch and, and our time with uh, Mark Wagenberg. Yeah, thanks again, Jen. Thanks, Mark, for for hosting us. It was amazing. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this ride along video. And if you did, please remember, give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just hit that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And also consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Uh, Patreon supporters do get the added benefit of getting this content early and ad free. And you also get a discount in the Active Town store where you can get all sorts of good stuff like my streets are for people swag. Uh, Again, thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.